Welcome to another one of these, whatever they're called, whatever chats, they're called. fireside chats, this That's time right. with Chris McCord. Chris, who are you? I feel like we should do intros. Chris, who the hell are you? I'm the creator of the Phoenix framework for Elixir, so it's like our uh, de facto web framework. And I've released a couple of other libraries around Elixir, but that's mostly what um, I'm known for. Sweet. And I'm known for being weird on videos. I, I, I picked you in particular because I want to talk about serverless because you're the, you're the person with some opinions and I want to hear what they are. So I'll start by giving us something of a definition of the serverless I'm thinking about, which is it's a tool that allows you to horizontally scale bits of code. And so you're only paying for what you use. I feel like functions as a service and serverless are kind of used semi-interchangeably. Maybe that's incorrect, but um, that's the kind of serverless that I'm thinking about. And so when people that's want my, to use it, that's right? That's my understanding as well. I use yeah, those okay. interchangeably. You know, obviously having that horizontal scaling is great for billing, but is that always the way to go? Like it's really popular in the JavaScript world, but what do you think? That's a very good question. Um, okay, so I'll give my answer first, then I'll, I'll add some some information. Okay. Uh, I think it's I think serverless is silly. It's the kindest thing I can say about it. Um, but I think the nuance to that is what I hope to, to to really talk about. So if we step back, like one of these little libraries I made for Elixir is called Flame. My own kind of motivations are to like I like to say like ruthlessly eliminate layers of the stack. Elixir gives me that in, in many ways. So like not having to use Redis just to do like shared state, even even on the same machine or instance, you, people use Redis just to talk to like IPC inter process communication. Elixir removes things like that. I'm in this mindset of like, well, what else can I do in Elixir just to like remove these layers? And historically it's been like, you know, distributed pub sub just works, um, doing remote, remote procedure calls across the cluster just works. I don't need a dependency for that. Uh, except for this elastic scalability. So there's, this is where I never had a good answer to serverless was like, you know, if I wanted to do some heavy computation, like video encoding, I would need to pay some AWS Lambda functions as a service thing to do that for me because I didn't have kind of tools that give me that in Elixir. So that's where I went off and, and made Flame to be the answer to just like removing all this complexity and just keeping everything within the stack that I'm used to. The moral of the story is like, what if we didn't have to do all of this nonsense? So like all these proprietary layers that seem to serve no one, not the developer, certainly seem to serve just the, the cloud companies. What if we could just treat our elastic scalable code as just like a function call? And that's mm -hmm. what we can do, at least in Elixir. What if you could just have a you know new promise, but that new promise ran on some ephemeral infrastructure somewhere. That's what we can do in Elixir. I actually want to dig into it for people who don't know much about Elixir or even Erlang. I, I don't know how much of this is Erlang and how much of this is Elixir, but can you tell us a little bit more about that idea of like just slicing out a piece of code to go run it somewhere else? Like that feels, that's to, to other languages, that's like a, what is that? And yeah, so can you explain how that works? And yeah, it's still, yeah, it's, it's pretty ridiculous. Um, so it starts with like, you know, Erlang in like the eighties, they accidentally solved multi-core computing before multi-core was a thing. And in doing that, they accidentally solved like distributed computing before like these things were networked together. Whoa. Uh, so, so the way this works is they imagine you want to write a, uh, platform for like telephone calls and you want to be able to have that be reliable and upgrade the system as it's running. You want a lot of calls at the same time. So they wrote this virtual machine and language to do that. And in solving those problems, they needed to um, have these calls going on at the same time. So they needed to have concurrency and they wanted it to be robust. So it needed to run on multiple machines. So they solved this um, distributed programming problem, but what they really did, the secret is like the unit of concurrency. So like what people would think of as like threads or promises, mm -hmm. uh, that, that unit of concurrency we call a process uh, is location transparent, which is a fancy way to say it doesn't matter where it's running, uh, it could be running on another machine. So like in, in JavaScript, again, imagine if you could say new promise, but that new promise could be on another server somewhere. Like if you could pass that instance around of that promise, and if you pass it to another yeah. server, the VM, <laughs> but imagine V8 or whatever JavaScript runtime just said like, oh, that lives on this other server and I can just ferry the uh, results back and forth. So that's what Erlang, the VM just does for you. And that's what made the serverless, uh, getting rid of serverless and adding elastic compute to Elixir very, very easy. This could have been done 10 years ago, this, this whole flame thing. 
We just needed a platform to be able to start instances very quickly. Exactly. How does this work? Yeah, so Flame works by uh, just using the Erlang VM features to like get RPC messages back and forth. So the only thing we had to solve for is just like getting your code on a server or a VM somewhere up and running and talking back to the parent. Uh, mm -hmm. So Fly was the first backend we wrote for that. Um, so Fly solved the fast launching compute, which is kind of necessary when you want to just say, hey, run this function that you were running, but somewhere right. else, you, you need that like server to, to start up as fast as possible. And that's what like serverless and function as a service kind of give you, right? They like mm -hmm. to say that they have like, you know, tens of milliseconds, maybe hundreds of milliseconds, worst case startup time. So fly, you know, we're not in the hundreds of milliseconds unless you suspend a machine, but let's just say from scratch, I'm not paying for any resources, I have nothing and I want to start some elastic compute somewhere, that's about three to five seconds to have or my Elixir node doing some useful work for me, um, which is pretty dang good. And we can talk about cold starts. There's a lot of nuance there. What's interesting, I, I think cold starts are a little bit scary, but to be fair, that's not a fly problem. That's a, anytime you do this kind of, anytime you're, I mean, even if you're working with, if you're working with Firecracker, for one thing, which we are, you know, and you're doing this kind of elastic scaling, the cold starts are a thing you have to care about regardless. Um, you know, Lambda has to care about cold starts, so do we. Not to toot our own horn too much, you know, we don't really charge for the, we don't charge for the compute of a stopped machine. So if you wanted to, you could have a fleet of machines at the ready. So it's just it's a like, matter of like, like starting It's like pennies, right? I want to throw in a wrench to this conversation. So this talk isn't entirely like, we're so great. It's perfect, right? So yep. here's the thing. The people of this video, I really want to target. Or I, want, I want to be a part of the conversation is the JavaScript community because... Sure they're the ones who made serverless really big, right? And yep. initially, I think there was also not just a financial incentive, but also a simplicity to serverless that was really attractive to actually a lot of front-end people. I mean, it goes beyond front-end people as well, but this idea of like, I just need this one little endpoint to do this one little thing and talk to the database and get the user ID or whatever it is, right? Get me all the latest blog posts, who knows, right? I can see the appeal of that. Something like Lambda, you do kind of have to split up your code, but with other platforms as a service like Vercel, I think one reason people really love Vercel is because it has such intimate knowledge of these different JavaScript frameworks. Obviously, I mean, they own Next.js, so of course it's very well integrated where you have these different routes and it knows by just looking at your code, which parts of it need to be cut off and used as a serverless function. They know which parts to do that with because they have an intimate knowledge of Next.js and some other frameworks. And so in that case, you, you don't have to break up your code and you still get the benefits. And JavaScript has a hard time doing flame right now. It's, it's, it works, yep. you can do it, but it's not, it's not elegant the way it is in Elixir. But I would say the same problem problem exists, right? The same problem exists for other languages too. So in that case, how do we still get that kind of elastic scale if not with serverless? Yeah, so I think the Vercel is a good example of, I also think it's wrong, but it's a good example of the ergonomics <laughs> that you could do. So Vercel is like, to my understanding, um, if you have a next app, it's gonna horizontally scale by the route, right? So like so, yeah. you're, scroll, you're scaling at, at the route level, which I think is incorrect. And this is where Everyone, even the Elixir community before Flame, this is what bothered me is people would try to auto scale and auto scale meant to most programmers like Heroku, like you scale up the dyno. So everyone's thinking mm -hmm. like, oh, we have to scale at the web request level. And to me, that's not granular enough. It's like, you're not just like boot a bunch of more web servers to handle web requests. It's, you know, it's like, what are those web requests doing, right? If they're just talking to a database, like we're not like the database is going to be the thing we, we want to focus on scaling. But like if we're doing anything IO or CPU bound, like the actual expensive thing that needs the elasticity, that's the thing you want to scale at that level. And that's what functions as a service Ooh, gave yeah. us. So the route based scaling for me is just a failed concept. It's, it's the same thing as load balancer scaling where like, you know, fly, we have this feature too, where you can say, I want, um, as requests come in, I want the fly proxy to notice that I'm at my max concurrency limit for HTTP requests and start up more fly machines for me. So to me, this is a, I like to say like you're flailing around, just like mashing the start server buttons, hoping that it solves a scale problem. And that's what Vercel is doing. They've just packaged it as this fancy feature. It's just basically load balancer scaling. To touch on your simplicity point, the problem is it's, this is not simple. If the, if the lie <laughs> and the trick is telling people this is simple, and telling them that they only pay for what they use. And at the end of the day, it's more complex and they end up paying way more than just having a server running somewhere.
what I mean by that is like, imagine you have this, this work being done in this stateless function as service or reverse cell router. If all you're doing is taking the request and putting a response, it's simple. But the moment you want to do anything with the thing that happened there, you're having to like add polling to your application. You're having to put this ephemeral-ish state that is yeah that you, could th you could throw away, except we have to actually have to get another function on the service to grab onto that thing. So now you're storing it in SQS or whatever Vercel offers as far as some like kind of storage. So you have all these layers, and then how do you test that thing? Oh, and then how do you actually run it locally? Like so, the simple thing, the moment you try to do anything that steps outside the guardrails, and I'm not even talking like contrived examples. One example would be like the user's uploading a file. Maybe you want to show some information about what you're doing with that thing. Like that becomes this like labyrinth of complexity. Whereas like your your language JavaScript, who birthed the idea of WebSockets, trivial WebSockets, like they should that should be three lines of code. I don't buy this simplicity argument, and especially on Vercel, like I think they nailed the UX of like getting an app running. Yeah. But I think it's entirely self-serving to the company. It's not good for the framework. It's not good for the users. Where, like, I can run a next server locally, and that works great, right? And I should be able to do WebSockets and things on that. Why is it when I deploy this thing suddenly it's this like madness to get real-time communication? Over ten years ago, I was inspired by Socket IO. So like the mm -hmm. JavaScript community, like they had, they own this. I was so jealous of what they could do. And we're talking about 10 years later, um, these main offerings in the community can't or are barely starting to get WebSocket support. I think about the simplicity thing. I think it seems simple when your app is very simple uh, because you're, you're not having, because you're right, it's not even edge cases. It's just like the moment you start to need something beyond the ordinary. Actually, I think a lot of the things are very ordinary that people end up reaching for. But at the beginning, I, I see the appeal of that initial idea of just write the bits of the code, just write these little chunks of server-side code that need to act as your backend. I get the attraction to that. I, I'm not going to argue like that. That's good court organization. I think that works well for people, but like that to me is like conceptually that can work for how requests come in and you the little bits of code yeah. do this, but to apply that to its natural conclusion of, and that's how my infrastructure runs is where it arbitrarily restricts the, the framework in my opinion. I also want to think about the idea of elastic scale outside of the context of serverless, because we scale out, like you can, you can elastically scale machines as well based on throughput, right? Can you help me talk this through? Like how different is it? On fly, you've got machines that will scale down when, you know, it's, you know, crickets, there's no requests coming in. How different is that compared to serverless? What are you giving up or, or how similar is it? What do you think? If you're just scaling at like the HTTP level, like if I'm running, like a good example is like large language models, I could scale yes. those at the HTTP level, run the yes. HTTP server and everything's happy. They scale down um, when they don't need requests. Like to me, that's quite reasonable. I don't know why I would use like Lambda for a uh, large language model unless I was could get it drastically cheaper. I like to touch on like the FFmpeg example is the the classic one because everyone it, that's like the the expensive thing that everyone ends up paying like but that's a good example because it's not if it's just request response and that's all you need to scale then use a fly thing use a load balancer knob whatever AWS has I think that's a roughly equivalent of of when we're talking serverless but it's like if you want to do anything with this artifact that happens in this serverless thing that's when all the complexity attacks on and that's when the load balancer scaling falls down because it's not just what happens when you start the server up, it's like everything that needs to happen downstream. Yeah, can you describe that scenario with FFmpeg? I, I know you describe it in your blog post where it's actually, there's more involved than just like, just scale when the request come in, comes in. Yeah, so like the example I give is like, you know, Phoenix Live View can do file uploads as most frameworks can, but like imagine you wanna generate thumbnails of the video and my demo is like, I actually can generate the thumbnails as it's being uploaded, which is pretty cool. But most folks would have to like put that onto S3 somewhere, spin up a Lambda that then pulls the file from S3, processes it with FFmpeg. Essentially what you need to do is like do some work on this file. And then as these thumbnail artifacts pop out of this file, if you want to get them to the UI somewhere, um, that becomes this big problem. But imagine you just want to save them to some database, you want to put the URL for the thumbnail somewhere, and then you want to put that thumbnail back onto cloud storage. So you can 
do those things as those thumbnails are being generated. But then if you want to tell your app about it, like let's say I can put the file into S3 and then I need to tell my app that actually, hey, I put this thumbnail onto S3. I need to put that into SQS and then I have to write the SQS consumer in my app that pulls SQS and picks it off and says, oh, this thing was put into S3 and then I write that to my database because my Lambda probably can't talk to my database. So you have all these steps and imagine you, you then wanna tell the user, hey, these thumbnails are available or like YouTube populates the UI with the thumbnails on the timeline. Like if you wanna get that back to the app, now you're writing like polling code on the client. So there's like all these things that you have to do that should otherwise be in your quote unquote naive code, a few lines of code. So would you say, okay, gun to your head, you're not allowed to use Elixir anymore. Would you still want to avoid serverless? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. And I have to think about how the elastic scale problem would work. Uh, I know that we've done some experience, experiments at Fly with um, Flame type workflow. So Flame is basically just a, a way to run your code on, an, on a new instance somewhere. Right. And in JavaScript, you can get a pretty ergonomic approach by just, um, you can't get, like we can't take a closure in JavaScript and run that on a server. So you have to mm -hmm. like move that code you want to run elastically to a new file. But to me, this is like not any different than like file-based routing. Like it should, the ergonomics should be quite good there. I do think there needs to be some library or framework level integration to make this like a, a fully integrated experience. But there's there's no reason for me that, that that couldn't be done. But I think a lot of these platforms, I'll pick on Vercel again, only because the topic is recent in my mind. I, I start with the premise of like, what if we just didn't have to do all of these things? And one of the examples is like this idea of like partial pre-rendering which uh, again, I've never used, yes. but my understanding of this is that you want the you want your web page to load as fast as possible. So what you can do is like CDNs are a thing. This makes sense to to serve it near the users. While you're re, while you're re rendering at the CDN level, it's fetching the real time up to date data from your back end, and then it's like merging those two together on the edge. The client gets the page. First of all, amazing technological achievement. Very cool. Very cool. But like, what if you just didn't have to do that? <laughs> if you're running your app on the edge in some partial way to, in order to fulfill the request quickly and serve it partially, you still have to talk to some slow central data store because your database probably lives in US East one. What if you just ran your whole app on the edge instead, if that's what you wanted and you could partially render the app and then just by just using, using your regular JavaScript framework code, and the things that you wanted to be fetched asynchronously, you just write the promise that does a fetch request back right. to your server. So, so this goes back to like the JavaScript community has built all of these interesting abstractions and solved all these problems that for me don't need to exist in the first place. You mentioned, what if you just ran your whole app on the edge? That is a subject of a whole other conversation that we could dig into that we won't today, but I do think it's worth acknowledging that that is hard and when you say run your whole app at the edge you're talking about not just your code but not your, just your server code but also your data right and your store it your like uh, object storage is that what you're talking about it's it, ideally so yeah that's a yeah. that's a huge conversation so if your goal is to like truly live on the edge and get the benefits of the edge because if, if all your requests if all you can render in your partial pre-rendering is the skeleton of the app with a loader you're not doing a whole lot in my opinion so um, you really need to get the data close to the user. And that's mm -hmm. also, Agreed. like you said, very hard to do in most platforms. Um, not everyone, I feel like, needs to adopt this complexity. But yeah, Fly is one of the few places where you could actually reasonably do this. But I will say, going back to the, the simplicity, I, I want to stick on Postgres just vaguely because mm -hmm. I think, like, going back to this idea of, like, you know, the JavaScript community is real big on these functions of the service and and you, it feels like you gain a lot of these features, like elastic scale. It feels like you can serve the app fast on the edge, even if your data lives in some central store. That's just adding all these abstractions in the middle. Like what if you just ran your whole app and then a uh, Postgres replica on the edge? Okay, Decent last stuff. time I, f I, forgot, <laughs> I forgot to do any kind of outro. So we have, last time people were like, this video ends abruptly. What is happening? Yeah. <laughs> so I'm um, gonna uh, actually do, I don't have an outro prepared, but Thank you so much, Chris, for joining us for a potentially spicy, uh, angry comment inducing video. We'll see what happens. Yeah. Well, I'm hoping, yeah, I'm hoping there's some inspiration here. Hopefully it didn't dunk on anyone else's worker framework. It, the goal, it's really more of like, I was inspired by the JavaScript ecosystem only to arrive on the other side to be like, wait, you all aren't doing this anymore? Like, no, what? I don't understand. I'd love to see those folks uh, get into a similar space because I think they could actually do it really well, both on the real time side and the elastic scale side 
uh, without having it be ha- having to be blessed by a particular framework or uh, vendor. I agree. All right. Well, thanks so much for chatting, and uh, we'll catch people in the next video. Bye. Right. See ya.